Okay, let's see. Um, this uh, national what? Nap day holiday. I love naps. It's supposed to happen between 12 and 12. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you might come up with something like that. Oh, I mean, we still get a full hour of class and then some afterwards. It was mandatory, mandated by the African president of the Let's see here. Oh, All right, so we got that together. Okay. So, there we go. We're all teed up. Okay, so, uh, does anybody have any questions before we start? Homework's due on Saturday now instead of Sunday. Homework's due on Saturday now instead of Sunday. So, I, uh, uh was happy to see a lot of you, actually, almost half of you. I didn't count exactly, but uh, you guys had started your homework already, which is what you really need to do anyway with this course, the way it rolls. So um, chapter 10, hopefully, was in your sights already. Uh, I sent out an email to everybody so that, uh, so that hopefully you saw the homework can be done any time after the due date, too, with 20% deduction. So I wanted to give you a little incentive to hopefully tee yourself up uh, for Sunday and to get started on it early. So my intent with having the tests, the homework, and everything on Sunday was that you guys would have that done in a timely uh, fashion and not be scrambling at uh, you know 10 o'clock at night to try to get it all done. So, so I thought I'd give you a little extra incentive to have a little earlier time. You know what, the 20% penalty for doing it on Sunday, if you want to, you know, it's not going to kill your grade on the homework, but uh, if you miss one once in a while, so it's not a huge thing, but a little incentive to, to have you get it done on Saturday. So, saw some hands up. Um, the glitch that I had a couple weeks ago, I didn't do it last week, but it's done it again this week. I'm just curious what's happening to anybody else. I can't remember what the glitch was. Essentially, when you do... The, the main homework on the question section, like you'll say, like chapter 10 homework. Yeah, okay, the, the rapid fire questions. Yeah, uh, I have the thing. It shows I get all of them correct, and then when I go back to the homework screen, it showed like 9.87 out of 10. Just refresh it. Just refresh it? Yeah, yeah, see, I tried that, and it just it still shows that. I even closed the whole program out and opened it back up, and it still showed that. Uh, so he, he had it so that it was just like, Missing something that he got right, like 9.87 out of 10 instead of 10 out of 10, right. basically. Did anybody else experience that? Yeah. Yeah, I had that. Where it's real close? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I will fire that off to Pearson if uh, more than one of you um, has, has had the issue. So we don't know. Sometimes it's the maybe the machine you're using right. or whatever. So we, we don't know. So good. Glad you brought that up. <laughs> Say, what's that? Yeah, I set it up for all the homework for the rest of the semester. Okay, so if you get it from Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't do it retroactively. No, no, no. You're totally fine. Yeah. Right, just the homework only. So study plan as we talk, and I put this all in the email. Study plan all semester long. You can do them whenever you want. Homework, then with the twenty percent, and then the test. Yes. It does. No, that that mastery point is the study plan point. I do a lot. Well, come up and see me after class. We'll we'll take a look at it. Okay. Anything else? So hopefully you got my email that I'm inviting. This is open to outside of the whole university. Uh, uh, this is a book called Money, Greed, and God. And so I'm going to hold this book club. I did it last year, both semesters. And we just get together uh, informal um, at my house. I'll get some food in. I'll, sometimes we order pizza. Sometimes I've cooked up some ribs, smoke some, get my smoker going, get some ribs going. Uh, so it's from 5 to 7 on Sundays. The first meeting is uh, September 27th. And so um, it's kind of a fun time to just uh, get together. We basically eat for about the first hour, and then we talk about the book So in different chapters. So if you're interested in that, 
Or if you have other friends, again, it's not uh, just this class or just the business school, it's anybody campus-wide. Uh, and it, it's not anything that's too heavy-duty econ, it's you know, something that anybody can uh, read and, and uh, understand. So, um, any questions there? So I'm asking for this Friday, just give me a short little email that just says why you're interested, and then I'll uh, get, I'll get back to everybody Monday with who the group is, who's in the club. So, questions there? All right. So I guess that covered my two talking points. Oh, I know what my third talking point or announcement was. <laughs> is Prizes, I don't know if prizes is the right word, but uh, prizes and candy. Oh, Friday. So I just wanted to tell you, just to give you an extra incentive, hopefully, uh, we're going to do a trading game on part of Friday. So it won't, it's not going to take the whole time, but we got a little exercise to kind of get the feel for the supply and demand of the marketplace and whatnot. And so we'll do that on, we'll do that on Friday. We'll probably start off the class with that on, on Friday. All right, so today we continue on with where we left off on uh, cost curves in Chapter 11. And we, um, we came up with uh, costs in an equation that said, let's... Uh, if we think about the profits, this is just a little bit of short review here. Profits was total revenue minus total cost. And then we're essentially spending some time, not so much worrying about this in Chapter 11, but we're going to really talk a lot about this part. And so the first thing that we did was we said, oh, well, total cost can be looked at as total variable cost plus total fixed cost was the first breakdown we did in thinking about the types of costs that vary with the quantity I'm producing versus the types of costs that are fixed. And so in our grocery store, what was an example of some fixed costs? Utilities, right? So for the most part, we have our coolers and our overhead lights and whatever. That bill generally runs $500 a month. It doesn't really matter if I sell a thousand units, uh, beep beep beep, or a hundred units. My electric bill is going to be pretty much fixed over the month. But of course, the cost of that product is a direct cost that day. Each thing I beep is going to um, reduce my inventory by that amount. Okay, so that was the the general gist of it. And then we also uh, started to look at um, the uh, averages to crank these down into per unit costs. And so I, I gave you the first graph to try to motivate this where suppose total fixed costs were 100 units. That function looks like this because whether I produce 10 units, 100 units, 1,000 units, what's my fixed cost? 100 bucks. 100 bucks. 100 bucks. My fixed costs are indeed fixed, independent of the quantity that I do. So I'm being a little sloppy up here because you guys have this from your notes last time. The average fixed cost was a downward sloping looking thing because now the more I produce, the lower those costs would be. So a lot of bigger companies, uh, Walmart and some of those volume places, the bigger corporations, if you have a lot of fixed costs associated with your business, then volume pays off nicely, right? Because we're going to take that expensive fixed cost, and the more I crank out, the lower is my per unit cost, which means I can be more aggressive with price, and I can maybe outbeat my competitors and whatnot. All right, so that's just a quick little review of what, where we left off last time. Any questions there? Yeah. Yes, this is total variable, and we did not graph that yet. I'm going to save that one for a little bit. So we all I did is kind of wanted to motivate equation goggles and uh, a graphing goggle with the fixed cost at this point. Okay, any other questions, comments? 
All right, so um, before we get into more dollars, let's talk about the physical process that's going on. So before we talk more about dollars, let's consider the physical production process. The physical production process. So we're running our company and we have some people working for us, right? Hopefully they're happy. We have a building that we operate out of. Might even be creating a little bit of pollution or something. Right? And then we've got machines that help us make what we're doing. Maybe part of it's a keyboard or something or some sort of computer. So we've got labor and we've got capital and we've got maybe some other natural resources that we use. Maybe there's part of the land here and some other things that are all part of this process. And the entrepreneur squishes them all together and creates a basketball. Okay? So there's really a physical transformation, if you will, of converting basic resources into physical products that we care about. So these things are the final goods and services that bring us happiness that we learned in the, in the chapter. And these things are resources or factors of production. All right. Um, so I want to think about the physical production process. I was in the restaurant business for a long time. I started off as a cook at a greasy spoon restaurant called Jack's or Better that was right next door to my house. And so I started working there. Two months later, the, uh, the boss got me on the line and I started cooking. And so I want to use this. I like to visualize this tabletop here as my grill at the restaurant. And think about the production of burgers that I do as a person, right? So I use the grill and myself to make hamburgers. And what does that process, you know, end up looking like with production? So the first thing we're going to look at is the total product. The total product. This would be TP or Q, right? The amount of hamburgers, the amount of production that I do. And so total product is the total amount produced. And then I'm going to bring in the concept of marginal, as we always do in econ class. What's a good word to use interchangeably with marginal? Additional. additional, right? So additional product. Marginal product or additional product. So this is the marginal product. And so the marginal product is the additional amount of product from an additional unit of input. Or I'll put in parentheses here a resource. So another distinction that we make, or another word, we had so many different words. These were resources, they were factors of production, so sometimes we call them factors. We also look at them as inputs in the production process. So you can kind of use those interchangeably. Final goods and services, we might also call output or just Q, 
when we start thinking of the quantity produced. Right? So we kind of use these things interchangeably depending on the context we're looking at. Okay. All right, so back to my grill. I come back and let's say that I can crank out a hundred hamburgers uh, an hour or something, or maybe it's a day. Let's, let's use a day just for fun. I can crank out, that sounds pretty slow, but I can crank out a hundred hamburgers. So my output example, <coughs> Russ and the restaurant. Suppose Russ can cook 100 hamburgers per day. So I kind of do my thing. What happens if I add another person, another person to my operation? And of course we have more burgers too. What happens to my output with two of us working together? Does it go up to 200, something less than 200 or greater than 200 with two of us working instead of one? Depends on how you work together. Depends on how we work together? Okay, so what would cause it to go up? That sounds like a bit of a stretch. So if I have 100 hamburgers by myself, tell me a little bit more detail here. How do I get to something greater than 200, like 220 or whatever? Some specialization. Specialization. What do you mean by that? Like production runners, they put the funds and all that. Okay, good. So that's one way that we could gain some efficiency, right? So if I'm working by myself, I got to do everything. I'm watching the burgers, cooking them. I've got uh, the lettuce. I'm prepping the plates. Got the the tomatoes. Getting the cheese ready, right? I'm doing everything. If I bring in another person, then maybe I can focus on Patty and the burgers, toasting the buns. The other person preps the plates. The two of us together can increase efficiency through specialization, Adam Smith, 1776, The Wealth of Nations, the division of labor and specialization of labor could allow us to maybe get up to 220 or something. Now, if I had a third person, are we going to get up to 440? More than 440? Less than 440? Might start to be some congestion, right? Now, we could tell a story where there's another level of specialization where now you only do the patties, the other person does the buns and lettuce, the other person, right? We could, we could tell that story again. But then I come back to you and I say, suppose we had a fourth person, a fifth person, a sixth person, a seventh person. Hey, what are you doing this Saturday? I'm going to seventh, eighth person, right? Are we going to always see those increases? No. No, right? So eventually we're constrained by what? What's keeping us from being able to continue to do that? Space of the grill, yeah, and maybe some other things if we got into the building, but especially the grill space, right? So what, it's going to kick in faster if, if I can't vary the other inputs in my production process, if some of these are fixed, then what's going to kick in maybe more quickly than others, depending on what resource we're looking in at, is the law of diminishing marginal, not utility, but you're on the right track. Yeah. Similar concept. Marginal utility was the Oreo cookie, the third Oreo versus the fourth Oreo versus the fifth. Now we're talking about the production process because we have our restaurant hat on. And so the law of diminishing marginal product would kick in, keeping my production uh, uh, down at the margin, still going up, presumably, or at least not going too far down, if when, depending on how bad this congestion issue got. But that is an important principle of this whole thing here. The law of 
diminishing marginal product. As you add more and more, as you add more and more of a variable resource like labor, in my example, as you add more and more of a variable resource like labor to at least one fixed resource, like the grill top, like the capital of the grill space, from our example, as you add more and more of a variable resource to at least one fixed resource, the amount of product produced from each additional variable resource, parentheses, each additional cook, the amount of hamburgers, oh, and when I said uh, the amount of product, I wanted to put in hamburgers here, the quantity of hamburgers, the amount of product produced from each additional variable resource, each additional cook, eventually falls. eventually falls. How many dollars are we talking about with this concept? I like the way your head's shaking, verbalize. Zero. Zero. We're not talking about dollars. That's why I wanted to make sure you guys are getting here that we're talking about the physical production process. This is kind of an engineering thing, if you will. Some of you are looking at engineering here at Ottawa, right? So the physical production process of how these things are put together leads to those diminishing returns. Uh, Bethany, I saw you leave early last time. Did you get the message from him about our thing with my econ lab? That uh, you got to make sure that you're closed out of my econ lab. I'm not. I don't know what you're looking at now, but uh, make sure that all my econ lab and at the powerpoints. Okay, so powerpoints, fine. I, I'm okay with that. I'd actually probably prefer those to be gone too, but I'll, that, that's fine. I can live with the powerpoints. But my econ lab, as far as working on homework and all that, we could talk about this before. But I know you were you had to leave early last time, so I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so. What does this sucker look like graphically? If we're measuring now labor and hamburgers, <laughs> does this thing look like A, B, or C? C, right? Is kind of the big thing one that reflects the law of diminishing marginal product, that is reflected in a upward sloping. Why, do, why is it upward sloping again? Because the total is going up, right? So this is the total product curve. I have one person, two person, three person, four person, five person, six person, seven person, eight person. Each time I add people, I'm getting more hamburgers. But the additional hamburgers each extra person's bringing me is getting smaller and smaller. So this was very similar to that law of diminishing marginal utility, but it's, uh, it's a little different. So we're going to have this C. Now, I want to throw in the possibility, zero people, zero product. I said that maybe the first couple of people, we'd have some specialization of labor. So the total product of labor curve might look like this. Now look at what's going on here. I'm actually drawing a combination of A, B, and C, right? Here's the A chunk. 
early on, because of specialization, division of labor, I might be getting increasing returns. But eventually we get to this little, there's like an inflection point if you try to eyeball it where it, it quits going increasing at an increasing rate and starts to increase at a decreasing rate. That turning point shows where the law of diminishing marginal product kicks in. Right, so that's this part right in here, law of diminishing marginal product is kicking in right there. All right, questions or comments there? All right, so um, putting some just some really brief equation goggles on here, just so that we can kind of talk the language a little bit, even as you read some of this. The quantity of hamburgers is equal to some function of land, labor, and capital. This is a general way of kind of writing an equation. It really doesn't give you any meaningful information about their specific thing, but we kind of generalize that just as a reminder that our production function, so that's what this thing is, is the production function, the quantity of output, hamburgers in my case, equals this little symbol is a function of the things in the brackets. And the things in the brackets, I won't restate land, labor, capital, but I'll just say the quantities of resources. So all of what I've done so far doesn't involve any dollars, right? All about quantities of stuff. An engineer might be able to come up with 10 different plans, maybe even more, but 10 different plans to combine basic resources to make our basketball or our hamburger or whatever, right? So one plan might have a lot of machines and a little bit of people. Another plan might have a lot of people and a little bit of machines. Another plan might have a little bit different process going on in here. So we can have different blueprints of how we're going to make the thing that we're trying to make. Which blueprint are we going to pick? The one that's most efficient and cost effective. Good, right? So the economist steps into it and says, oh, thank you, engineer. Boom, boom, boom. I've got 10 choices. We're going to go with option four because I ran the calculations looking at variable cost, fixed cost, all kinds of stuff. And I think that this will be the most cost effective way to produce that product. And so that's part of what we end up doing when we combine the physical process with these dollars and cents that we're doing. All right. Um, so let's do. A little bit of dollars and cents here. So back to our, uh, you know, I guess one thing I wanted to do is uh, total product and marginal product. Uh, your total product function is what it is. So the marginal product of labor, for instance, is the change in total product, Q, from a change in labor. So this follows right with the definition I just get, gave you. This is the change in hamburgers. How many more hamburgers do I get from adding an extra person.
All right, so let's put these two things together here. So putting production and cost together. Draw a graph, give yourself plenty of room. We're going to measure dollars on the vertical axis, quantity on the horizontal axis. And I want to kind of have everybody draw this first, and then I'll explain it. It just goes a little easier that way because it's a little bit weird. So the average total cost curve is just kind of a bowl-shaped curve that looks like that. And just trust me for a moment here. So just draw, doesn't really matter on your paper where it is, just kind of give me a, a soup bowl look that looks like that. And then I want you to draw a big fat dot at the low point, the absolute minimum point. That's going to turn out to be an important point in different ways. The next thing I want to draw is the average variable cost curve, which turns out to also be a bowl, but watch very carefully how I draw this. It comes down, it bottoms out somewhere over here, and then as you're making the climb, what's happening to the vertical distance between the two? It's getting smaller, so do that. Just kind of practice. If your paper's not perfect, don't worry about it, but just kind of approach approach the average total cost curve as you draw it, and that's the average variable cost curve. <clears throat> and then go ahead and anchor the minimum point for that thing too. Just kind of figure out where your minimum point was. For an extra credit point, why is this thing getting narrower? I see a hand here, yes. Ooh, uh, you're close. Fixed costs stay the same. I want to work with you on this because I think you're, you're getting an extra credit point. I can see. So your fixed costs stay the same. So what's happening to your average cost, fixed costs? getting smaller, and why is this distance getting smaller? Hold on. Variable costs are going up? No. This is getting smaller and smaller on the distance between the two. You're dangerously close. Anybody want to help out? What is this? Why is this getting smaller? What is it? Because you increase your variable cost like your fixed cost becomes less as we go. And so what's the relationship between this average total cost and average variable cost? What's the relationship between the two? No? Go look back in your notes if you're kind of wondering. From this, We talked about this last time. Yeah. Good. Because... Yes, and your average fixed cost, though, it was said earlier, that's actually shrinking too, right? That was the first I, I erased it already. But remember the average fixed cost line? It was going down as we go, the vertical distance as we produce more quantities. So this distance here, let me give a couple extra credit points before I forget. <clears throat> I'm going to do both here because you got us started. Give me your name again. Bryce what? All right, Bryce, and our closer. Give me your name again. Daniel. Last name? Daniel. All right. So putting those two concepts together, that bridges the gap for us. This height here at this quantity, I could draw the average fixed cost. Remember it looked like this and get smaller? But I don't have to because that height is the <coughs> Because the two have to add together, as Daniel was bringing up, 
this vertical height here is average fixed cost. This vertical height from here to here goes up to the average variable cost curve, hang a left, read off this number, that is the average variable cost, that height, right? And that's why we use the curve. Average variable cost plus average fixed cost equals average total, which is the height of the average total cost curve. We add those two things together, my average total cost is over here. Yes? Is there ever a situation in which ABC or AFC will be zero? Um, possibly. This is We are talking about it in general here. Certainly there could be for a, like a homework problem. We can always assume real world problems away. But in reality, we probably always have a variable component and a fixed component. But it's possible. And especially given a particular circumstance, we might have one or the other. All right, everybody okay there? Did you see the equation that we used from before? I said memorize this. You guys got that? Remember I put a rectangle around it and I said memorize this, that's this. That's why. This kind of helps fill in the gap here. Average variable cost plus average fixed cost equals average total. The relationship between all three of those things. <clears throat> now, the most important cost we haven't even talked about yet, and that is marginal cost. Marginal cost is the change in total cost from an additional unit of production. That's our Q. Over here, just, these are some of the subtleties that you guys need to start to get. Always look at what you're measuring on the axes. Here, we've got the change in hamburgers from a change in another person. We add another person, how many hamburgers do I get? Here, we've got the marginal cost formula as the change in total cost from an additional hamburger. Triangle TC, the change in total cost over the change in quantity. All right, the reason I had you draw the big fat dots in here is you're going to play a little connect the dots game. The marginal cost curve in general is kind of a J-shaped thing that bottoms out before that first dot and cuts through the minimum point. That is the general marginal cost curve. It doesn't have this little humpy business probably going on, but uh, forgive my... All right, there we go. Big mess time. So super important relationship between the average and the marginal going on here that could be close to life changing for you, perhaps, on your thinking about average and marginal. All right, so let's say that uh, you've been at OU for two full years. You're starting your junior year. You're starting your junior year, and your GPA is a 3.0. Okay? Now that you're a junior, You've been starting to have fun with, with friends and started to hit the bottle a little bit on the weekends. And so on Ooh. fall, fall of, let's just hypothetically go into the future so that we can change ourselves later. Fall 2016, you end up getting a 2.0. Oh, Okay. Tough phone call to mom and dad, right? You've been doing good. Hey, your first two years are going great. 3.0, coach is off your back, you know. Then, whoops, fall 16, 2.0. What happens to your overall GPA? Does it go up or down? 
goes down, does it fall down to a 2.0? No. no, because you have a whole bunch of grades the two years that you were here. So it's going to come down, but it's not going to come down to a 2.0. You know, maybe your new GPA after that ends up being equal to, I'm just going to make up some numbers, a 2.8. All right, so now you're like, okay, the drinking was fun, but it's old, it gets old, I'm, I'm really concerned about my grades, I'm going to buckle up, I'll still go to the party, but I won't drink. And so you get better, and that semester, fall or spring 17, Spring 17, you get a 2.8. You did better. What happens to your overall GPA? It stays the same, right? So your GPA is not going to change. You're like, oh, crap. I really want to. Now I'm thinking about maybe graduate school or getting that job. I know that coach is on me because I want to maintain. I'm letting the team down because I'm not at a 3.0. Blah, 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 blah. I don't really care. Get your act together. Fall of 17, 4.0, baby. Bullets across the board. Does your GPA go up to a 4.0? Well, of course not, right? But it's going to help a lot. And so maybe we end up pulling this thing back up to a, oh, let's end the story nice at a 3.1. All right. So my overall GPA ends up climbing to a 3.1. Which one was your marginal grade? Which one was your marginal grade? The 2.8, the semester grades, right? So each semester, you're adding new data. These are your marginal grades. Whoops. Okay. Oh, that's right. I think I, I guess, sorry, I guess I went out of order here. So this is your average grade. Overall, this is what's happening at the margin. You were motivated at the margin, right? That's what changed things for you. That's what's going on with hamburgers over here and other sorts of products. When the cost of an additional unit, when the cost of an additional unit, the extra unit, the 30th unit, when the 30th unit costs less than the average, all 30 units cost me $10, but the 30th unit only cost me two bucks. What happened to my average? It came down, right? And that's why this is downward sloping right here, because the marginal cost, the cost of each additional unit, is less than the overall average. When the two are equal, over here at 70. The 70th unit cost me $9, and my average cost for all 70 units was $9, so my average stayed the same. And then finally, I get to a point where the average cost of producing 74 units is only $9.25. But the 74th unit cost me $14. Why? Because we've got that law of diminishing returns thing kicking in, is what this layered story is going to come back to. We're going to spend a little more time on this, so it's a little foggy. Questions? Comments? So memorize this graph. This is the basic general graph here where we got this thing going on. If you want to add in the minimum points, that ends up being kind of critical here. So that point and that point are the minimum uh, points for each curve. Minimum of the average variable cost, minimum of the average total cost curve. <laughs> All right. Um, boy, that looks like a good spot for love gov now. We need a little, a little simmering time. A little simmering time. I, we're gonna, we're gonna work on this a little bit more. I got some stuff. 
But let's let's see what old Gov is up to here. So this is episode four. We only got two left. Four and five. Here we go.
How did I get in all this debt? Can you help me? With what? Don't you have savings? No. I thought you had some high paying job. No, I don't have a job. I mean, I never really had a job. So now you're always throwing money around. Oh, I'm massively in debt. Massively. Except that it's actually other people's debt, so it's, uh, it's complicated. You ran up all this debt on me? Did you not know about this? I'm bankrupt. You bankrupted me. Do you two need a moment alone? Look, however bad bankruptcy is, no matter how bleak this looks right now, I just need you to keep one thing in mind. You still have to pay back your student loans, because those don't go away. Oh, no, you haven't paid those back yet? Oh, that's not going to close. All right, one of those left. Let's see how things end. All right, so we're going to put all of these things together, hopefully, with our example of the restaurant. And we're going to create a table of numbers that is about one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Uh, nine columns long. So here we go. <laughs> Labor. This is our restaurant example. Zero people. One person. Two people. Three, four, five. This will this will go quick. It's not too bad. One, two, three, four, five, that's our labor for our restaurant. And then the second column is our quantity of hamburgers. And with zero people, we get zero hamburgers. Uh, one person gets us 100. That's me. Uh, two people give us 220. Three people give us 320. Four people give us 400. And five people behind the grill give us 460. Whoa. Next column, you guys figure out the marginal product, not cost, marginal product of labor. Marginal product of labor. Good. Yeah. Oh, so so it's it's don't be a uh, one. It would be a hundred over one, which is your is about a hundred. Right? Right? So be a hundred, right? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, pause. Uh, yeah, uh, we had a situation in which we kind of have two options for tutoring, one paid, one free. Long story short, uh, Jason Dawes has another uh, student job, so she can't be our econ tutor, we learned. We didn't know this going into it. So Joe is also an econ major. Superstar in his own right, and knows econ pretty darn well, if I do say so myself. I think you've gotten nothing less than an A, if I remember right. So uh, Joe's our new econ tutor. So if you can put uh, your stuff on the board wherever, yeah, anywhere. Yeah, we can get our phones out of our right? Uh, that's fine, yeah. I guess if you want to take, if you want to put it in your phone, I'll let you take out your phone as long as you take it out. As long as you don't call Joe this second. <laughs> uh, 
All right, All right. cool. Yeah, just shoot me a text or an email if you need any help tonight. So there you go. Cell and email. So it is Joseph Siegel. There's the spelling. He's got to go to another class, so I just wanted to have him pop in. Thanks, Joe. Can everybody see that? Need me to got her down. So Joe will be hosting the uh, the review session for the midterm, which will be coming up uh, like Monday or Tuesday of. Are we next week? Or next? Yeah, we are. So we'll have more information about that coming soon too. All right. Oh, by the way, the midterm does not include what we're doing now. So it's not this week's stuff. I'm not going to pile that on you that quick. So it's all the previous stuff. So the first three modules is what the first midterm will be. When? Wednesday. In class, short answer type questions is what the midterm is going to be like. So we'll get more, in, we'll get more information on that. Am I, uh, this is right in my path here. So has everybody got this? To I guess I can leave it up for a little bit longer here. So marginal product, first person adds 100 hamburgers, second person adds 120, third, 100, 80, 60. So we see diminishing returns kicking in right here, right? So they start to go down. Yes? Okay, a good question. Um, so we got this in-between business that can be confusing sometimes. So let me, let me since you brought it up, um, let me bring up what that means or why we do this in-between business. You'll see with some of the graphs and some of the homework. This very well could have been, don't write this down on your paper maybe, but this could have been 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, right? And so then when you do the formula, the first 10 people give me 100 units. So the marginal product of labor is actually 100 divided by 10 gives me 10. Now, how do we plot that on a graph? We're just going to take the average in between. That's the middle business, right? Because it was the first 10 people. So on average, we'll just plot that right in the middle on a graph. Okay? If some of you don't quite get that, you might see that in a homework, but that's why the that's why the formula looks like change in Q over change in L, is if you have big jumps, that effectively converts it to a per labor person for each additional person. Any other further comments on that? I was going to talk about that later, but since you brought it up, I'll sneak it in right there. All right. <coughs> Here, I've got it as each additional person, so there's no need to do that since we've got it down to that point. All right, so um, what's next here? What does the average product of labor look like? The average product of labor, APL. So APL is quantity over labor. Dangerously close, I say dangerously because this screws up students a lot. Dangerously close to the marginal product of labor. What's it missing? The change, yeah, which is huge. That changes the whole question. So look at these two formulas. They're kind of similar, dangerously similar, because you get completely different answers depending on which one you're doing. So on average, one person gets me 100 units. What does on average one person get me, or when it, what does the average person get me when I have two people working for me? 110. 110, yeah. What do that, what does the average cook make for me when I have three cooks on the line? 106 and some change, maybe, right? 106.67 and Four divided by 100, the average person is cooking 100 hamburgers for me. And then finally, the fifth one, the average cook is getting me 92 hamburgers. 
Now, when I say economics might change some of your lives in basic decision making, I really mean it. Because look at, look at this. You'll see how many of you could imagine a small business owner running pizza time on Main Street thinking, if I hire the fifth person, how many hamburgers I'm, am I going to get? Well, on average, when I had four, I could make 100 pizzas, if I'm sw switching to pizzas on you. What will I have when I add five? Well, they're probably thinking about 100. But how much am I actually going to get by adding the fifth person? 60. That's dramatically different, right? That's a, we're off by a lot. We get that fifth person in and we're like, oh, things aren't working quite as I thought because we, we should have been able to produce 100. No, you shouldn't. You just didn't think about the constraints that you might have faced with other things in your business that causes the law of diminishing marginal product to kick in. That the fifth person's average product is a lot different than the fifth person's marginal product because of the law of diminishing marginal product, one of the most powerful concepts in econ that hopefully will stick in your craw for the rest of your life because a lot of people don't get that one. I see a hand up for good? Okay, let's bring some dollars into it. Um, Suppose that I can hire people at ten dollars a shift, or ten dollars an hour with a ten-hour shift, and we can measure the total cost of labor. In other words, how much are people going to cost me? Imagine if we got a wage of ten dollars per hour. We have a ten-hour shift. We just have to kind of hire people in lumps of 10 hour shifts, just to kind of motivate the, the idea here. Zero people creates zero cost for me. Switch the colors here, now that we're in cost. Oh, I should have kept green there. One person runs me how much? $100. Two people runs me 200 Three? 300, right. So I can keep adding as many people as I want for the $100 cost. All right, so um, cost is going up. Uh, we're not getting into the pizza cost. That'll, that, then we just get into the profits, which we're not touching on yet. All right, so there's total cost. What is our total fixed cost. Well, I'm just going to tell you it's $100 just for this problem. I will tell you this. You might see a homework or test problem here. When quantity is zero, that's how we can start off a lot of these tables. When quantity is zero, if in the words of the paragraph it says fixed costs are 100, at zero, I put 100 here. My total cost of production, this one I put the little L here, this is the total cost of labor. My total cost, labor plus fixed cost, would still be 100, even if I'm producing nothing. We'll come back to that theme later, but I just wanted to highlight that. I still have my fixed cost, even if I don't produce anything. If I'm closed on Sundays at my grocery store, I still have to run my $500 worth of electricity to keep my coolers and everything going, right? So I still have cost uh, even if I produce nothing. What is the total fixed cost associated with production of 100 hamburgers? 100. What's my total fixed cost associated with producing 220 hamburgers? 100, 100, 100, right? So it's 100 all the way down. So with our schedule goggles on, these numbers are fixed all the way down the column. With our graphing goggles on that we did at the top of the hour, the graph was perfectly horizontal. Same concept here. As quantity increases, my fixed costs are constant. They're fixed. All right. <clears throat> so my total cost of doing business is simply the addition of my labor costs which is my variable cost, by the way. We probably could just put total variable cost. Total cost of labor is our variable cost. Total variable cost. 
Variable cost plus fixed cost gives me my total cost. 100 plus 100 equals 200, so go ahead and just fill these out. Total variable cost plus total fixed cost, when I'm producing 220 hamburgers, it gives me 300, 400, 500, and finally 600. All right, I'm going somewhere with this, trust me. What is the change in total cost? The change in total cost. Well, it's kind of undefined here, perhaps. How much is my cost going up by? 100 each time I go, right? So, what kind of uh, deceiving thing I'm trying to bring up here is that we had the marginal cost curve going up. The marginal cost curve were going up, the costs were increasing, but here, hopefully doing kind of a reasonable example, I hire more people, I get more hamburgers, I get costs. My cost, I can hire people at a rate of $10 an hour for the 10 hour shift. It seems like my costs at the margin are constant, aren't they? If I was to graph out the wage or the shift pay, they'd both look the same. I want to hire one person. How much does it cost me? $10 for every hour. $10, $10, $10. Or if we look at the total pay with the one hour shift, 100, 100, 100. My costs are going up at a fixed rate. If I go, if we get back a little to reality here and think about the hamburger, does the fourth, fifth, and sixth hamburger cost me more or less money with the actual cost of the meat from the butcher compared to the 20th burger, or the 30th burger, or the 100th burger? Probably not, right? I'm buying that stuff for $4 a pound. Uh, if I call up Costco, I can get 100,000 pounds probably, even if I only need 20, right? So I can buy the materials at the same rate. I can buy people at the same rate. But yet I'm arguing that the costs are increasing. If you look back to that J-shaped marginal cost curve, the costs are going up each time, even though they seem to be constant. What is the marginal cost curve? Look real carefully at the formula I gave you earlier. What is the marginal cost curve? Change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. All right, so we've got that information here. We've got the change of quantity going on. That's our marginal product, this column. We've got our change in total cost was 100, 100, 100, 100. So our marginal cost of producing at this level with one person the marginal cost was 100 units divided by the extra quantity of 100. My marginal cost was a buck per unit, a buck per burger. On average, that burger ran me a dollar. After taking into account my fixed cost and my variable cost, that one single burger after producing this level, 100, <coughs> ran me a buck. What is it at this level of production? $100 worth of total cost, change of total cost, divided by 120. So my production went up by 120 hamburgers, so the change in quantity was 120. 
100 divided by 120 turns out to be 84 cents. At this level, I'm producing 320. The extra third person gave me an extra 100 hamburgers. So the change in cost was 100 divided by the change in quantity, which was 100. And I'm right back to a dollar. Now we start to get some diminishing returns. Change in cost of 100. Change in quantity, 80. I only got 80 units out of that change. 100 divided by 80 is a buck 25. And finally, the last person hired bumped up my total product to 460, but that extra person only added 60 units. 100 divided by 60 gives me a buck 67. Despite my extra labor being $10 an hour, hire as many people as you want, despite my per unit cost of burger being $4 a pound, make as many burgers as you want, despite those costs being fixed for additional inputs, my marginal cost per hamburger is going up. Why? Because what? You're making, less You're making less burgers per person. The law of diminishing marginal product creates the law of increasing costs. So even though burger and labor and other things might be the same, diminishing marginal product creates the law of increasing cost. These two concepts are interrelated with each other. So I'll come back to that in a little bit because we need we need some pricing to get into that to to see what's most profitable, and we'll spend a lot of time on that. So I'll come back to it. But right now we're just trying to hone in on this idea of cost. Another question or comment? All right. So this right here shows the law. Oops, I'm running blue. the law of increasing costs. The law of increasing costs is really the kissing cousin to the law of diminishing marginal product. The law of increasing costs is the kissing cousin to the law of diminishing marginal product. In other words, the law of diminishing marginal product caused the law of increasing cost. That's what gave us the connection here. This is this is why the marginal cost curve is upward sloping. So that is sometimes a homework test type question. Why is the marginal cost curve upward sloping? Answer, the well, law of diminishing marginal product. Because in reality, if I purchase more hamburger would the butcher tend to give me a better price or a worse price? Better. A better price. So if I was getting $4 a pound, if I come back and say, hey, I'm, I've got a large order this week, and they're like, oh, I'll cut you a price of three fifty dollars a pound. <coughs> that concept of getting deals because you're buying large volumes goes against this. And that's why I like to bring this up, because the law of diminishing marginal product trumps that. That is, a, that is something that will get kind of washed out from the law of diminishing marginal product.
All right. Other questions, comments there? So let me put on that last note here. Note. Despite uh, deals for bulk purchase of hamburger or the fact I can hire as many people as I want. as many people as I want at a wage of $10 per hour, marginal cost increases due to the law of diminishing marginal product. And might be kind of helpful just to tie this back to our graphing goggles. I'm just going to draw a little graph here. You guys can draw a big one if you want. But the thing I want you to remember is that we're measuring hamburgers here. So make sure your Q looks like this, 100, 220, 320, 400, 460. It's going to be kind of weird scaling. But... 100, 220, 300, or 320, and what are we up to? 400 and 460. All I'm doing, you guys, is just running down this list right here. 100, 220, 320. Just kind of scale those on. You'll get the gist of it once you now map out these numbers here. It's going to look like that J shape, right? It's going to look like that J shape. So if I have 50 cents and a dollar and two dollars, one, two, this is 50 cents, this is uh, 150, just kind of plot these points just to kind of drive home that J shaped look. At 100, we had a dollar, 84 cents at 220. Back to a dollar, and then it starts going up from there to a buck twenty-five, and finally a buck sixty-seven. Question? This graph, I just wrote down the numbers of these quantities. Yeah. That's the horizontal axis. I just went boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And then I mapped out dollar, 84 cents, and then that gave us that J shape that, that we did before. Okay. All right. Any other questions there before I erase? We're going to talk about timing next. So, short run, short run, ah, right today. Short run versus long run.
short run versus long run. This gets into the kind of the timing of decisions. And I, we talked about this on Monday um, with the restaurant, the English professor. English professor's losing money. Does that mean he goes out of business right away with the first set of losses? No, right? So we talked about that process of, well, let's try next year. Let's try next year. Let's try next year. Let's try next year. Eventually, if those losses persist, the you suck signal was coming out big and strong for the English professor, then we've probably met that long run decision of time to get out of here. What has the English professor done in the meantime? In other words, that first loss and then, oh, we're going to uh, tighten up the buckle, do a little better. What types of things do real businesses, how many of you have known some businesses, small businesses in your hometowns that have gone out of business? Right? Should be a few of them, right? I mean, every town has them. Uh, it turns out in an economic system, losses are about as important, if not more important, than profits, actually. So we get kind of this churning. What did you notice those people doing before they quit their doors for good? What types of stuff were they doing? Sales, clearance, Sales, clearance specials, special promotions, new coupons. Sometimes they threw an ad on television, right? At their place, do you think they were trying other maybe lesser expensive combinations? If it's a restaurant, for instance, of food, oh, let's try that. You know, this pizza's great, but there's this other cheese from this other company that's about 75% of the price, right? And look for new machines. They're always kind of looking and twisting and turning and squeezing and both on the, hopefully, the revenue side of trying to get more people in the door through coupons and other advertising, as well as on the cost side, we're cutting labor, the owner's washing their own dishes, all kinds of stuff, right? So there's a lot of stuff going on between that time. And so... That is the distinction that economists make between the short run and the long run. It is not a period of time, like a year, a month, or five years. But it's a period of time in which at least one factor of production is fixed. So the short run, I guess I can just put SR since I already got it defined up there. The short run is a period of time in which at least one resource or factor of production is fixed. A period of time in which at least one resource, resource, resource is fixed. The long run is a period of time that allows all resources to be changed. Or varied. So if you imagine a timeline where here is today and time just keeps going on like this, the short run is that time period that We've got at least one thing fixed. Something is fixed. Now, if you were operating a business here on Main Street in your town or in Ottawa, what might be fixed? If you're operating on Main Street, what might be a fixed thing for you for a period of time? Taxes, depending on which type. Building costs, the rent is probably fixed, right? Because normally businesses enter into a lease. For a commercial business, 
it's generally going to be a year, although there might be mom and pop owners that say, oh, I don't care, just I'll do a month to month lease. And so your, your rent might be only a month fixed, but most of the time it's going to be a year. If you start to get into fancier commercial buildings, those might be five to 20 year leases. So the period of time in which something's fixed via a contract or something else could be long or it could be short. So for example, the rent payment with a lease might constrict our business in the short run to the size of the building they're in, or it might be a, a constraint that they face. Certainly on a given day or a week or something, they can't change buildings that fast, right? So we got the short run somewhere in there. And in the long run, once we get, once we determine in our business, what is the time where, you know, no matter what I have, whatever my land labor capital is, I can change any of it. Everything's on the table. I can get a new building, I can get a bigger building, I could get a smaller building, right? So the long run, Everything can be varied or changed. Now I chose my words pretty carefully there. What about cost in the long run? What type of costs do businesses face of the types of costs that we talked about? In the long run, what are all costs? Variable, yes. We don't have any fixed costs. When we're thinking long term, it's like, what is the best way to run this business? Should I be in a small building, a big building, or a large building? Well, with a long enough time horizon, you choose. Everything can be chosen in the long run. So all costs are variable in the long run. There are no fixed costs. So one of the key points here is that there are no fixed costs in the long run. All costs are variable. All costs are variable. So, suppose you're thinking about uh, running a photography business and you're going to start up in your basement. What is the short run for you, or the long run, right? It's kind of this breaking point, but you're running a photography business, you're doing it out of your basement. Talk to me about the costs or the items that you need to run your business, the types of inputs that you need. Yeah. Camera, good, what else? Ink, maybe some inkjet or some special ink if you're doing some pictures that way. Background, Background. yeah, you need those roller things that come down that have all the things and maybe, what else? Advertising, Photoshop. some Photoshop, some software, lighting, yeah, lighting's huge. You got that big umbrella, the silver umbrella, right, with the lighting. How long will it take us to get more of that or get rid of it, but let's think of buying more. My business is growing. How long will it take me to vary any of those items? Big umbrella, fancy lights, computer. How long will it take me to get new stuff of that in? The ink, the camera, give me a time frame. What do you think? A week, maybe two at the most, right? If it's some sort of specialty thing that they don't keep in stock all the time, they have to kind of special order it. But literally, for your photography business, the short run might be two weeks. The long run and the short run, that break might be two weeks. Shift gears, we're John Deere. We're a big multinational corporation. We make tractors. What is the short run long run breaking point for John Deere at which at what point can they vary 
everything. Ten years, five years. What are some of the things that we need to think about when we're big John Deere if we want to increase production again? What are some of the things they need? Different kinds of tractors. I mean, they might have those the blueprints, but maybe they're trying to do a new one. They have to design some new tractors. New technology. Uh, let's just say they want to expand what they're doing. So business is booming. China is now a big player in the tractor market. They figure they're going to put a new plant in California. How long is it going to take them to, uh, uh, to open a new plant in California? A couple of years. I think I'm with you on a couple, three. Depends on getting through the city with the plans, acquiring the land. That might be a, a, a task. And if we have to change the zoning on the land, we might be up to five years if we have to fight some landowners because I need a pretty big parcel to put up this 100,000 square foot manufacturing facility, right? So what is the amount of time that it takes John Deere? I don't know, I'm guessing it's at least two years to get everything in place, the design, the architect, get all of that through the process. Maybe it's three years, maybe it's five. But my point with that is that the long run and the short run is not determined by a time frame of week or a year, like greater than a year, that's the long run. Less than a year, that's the short run. It's not that at all. It's specific to a particular business. For the photography business, the long run might be two weeks. For John Deere, the long run might be two years. It just depends on how your business works and your ability to change your resources. So example, photo in basement. So the long run might be two weeks. Go to Amazon or order stuff and get shipped in. I can vary all of my resources in as little as two weeks. I can turn over everything. Example number two, John Deere. We're going to open up a new plant. New plant in California. Long run might be two to five years. Why? Because we need to acquire the ground, design the building, you know, hire a new staff. I mean, the list goes on and on. If we have a facility that employs um, uh, 2,000 people or something, there's a whole process in and of itself to hire that amount of people. Okay, so what does this concept look like graphically? I'll leave that down there. We're just going to draw one graph. So, a little graphing goggles here. Let's draw quantity down here, dollars up here. And let's draw one of those average cost curves that we learned about today. So the average total cost, we're not going to have, draw average variable, but just average total cost. Now to minimize cost, where is the most efficient level of production given our current resource base? What, what's, what's the most efficient quantity to be producing given our current quantity of resources. Right at the minimum, right? So this is the cost minimizing quantity. Let's just call it uh, 1,000 units. At Q equal to 1,000, we have successfully minimized cost at $100 a unit. My average total cost is 100. But that's operating out of my small building. Maybe it's uh, 
Maybe I'm operating on a 2,000 square foot building. So right now I'm fixed in my small building, paying my rent and all that stuff. As my business goes on, I start to expand. Business is good, just like what we want the American way. And we start to get orders out to 1,500 one week. My average cost, of course, went up. Now, if that happened on just one blip, am I going to go buy a new building right away? I'm just no. optimistic. No. no. But time and time again, I start to absorb the average cost being higher. So at this cost, we're now running $110 a unit, right? But no big deal. Let's see if this thing rides out week after week after week after week. 1500 1500 1500 1500 Just say, hey, I, I, think, I think we got something here. We got a winner. Let's get a bigger space because right now I have to hire more labor, pay them overtime. Diminishing returns is kicking in because of my small building. At this type of level, I could be possibly at uh, a building that looks like this. So I'm going to cross that one. If you guys want to draw, try to watch where that thing cuts through. I'm going to ramp up to a medium-sized building with 3,000 square feet. When my production levels stay at 1,500, I am really able to be lean and mean and drop my average cost per unit down to 1,500 or down to $90 per unit. Now I can be even more aggressive on price and all of that. But here's the catch. If the market softens and I drop back to my old production level of 1,000, What's true about my cost per unit? Shoots back up, even higher than where I was before. Right? So now my cost of production jump up to $107. I'm starting to sweat a little bit, like, oh, maybe that wasn't the right move. Maybe we jumped the gun getting into the big building, right? So the mix of resources, the quantity of labor, capital, machines, or whatever, is not quite right in the medium-sized building if our production is only 1,000. Now, if we're lucky enough to get out to 2,000 units, maybe it's time to get into another new building that would drive down my cost even more. The 4,000 square foot building, the large building, if you will. At 2,000, I can be down here. How many different theoretical buildings are there actually? Whatever you want, right? So don't draw this on your paper. Leave this one just for me here. You could be in this size building, 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 this size building. And if we do that, we start to create the outer envelope of all of these short run curves ends up being the long run average total cost. Long run average total cost is the squiggly line here. So instead of drawing all the curves, you guys might just want to do a little squiggly. You'll see prettier pictures in your textbook when you do your reading. You can see that concept. Long run cost curve versus short run cost curves. We'll see you on Friday. Did you get going? You're jailing, right? Did you get going on my lab or what's going on? Yeah.
But what about what you been doing on all of stuff? What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, are you sure you're going to be able to keep up, or, I mean, otherwise you might think of dropping if you don't, if you're not able to car walk with no time, but, because, uh, this, I mean, this is going to be an hour, but if you get in the time, it's not too late, that's why I sent out the email. Um, so get in, and uh, I told you on that email I'll give you a freebie. So if you need me to open up, the tests are going to be locked down, so you're going to have to send me an email to uh, unlock those. And then we can get you get you set up. All right. right. Um, on the money, I wasn't able to afford the program and stuff. You weren't what? I wasn't able to afford the program. Okay. Like I went initially, 